course, uh, in Psalm 23, verse 2, it says, He leads me beside the still water. So, the Lord is my shepherd. He leads me. The Lord is my shepherd. He leads me. Interesting scripture here also in uh, Isaiah chapter 11, verse, uh, you might as well, well read 6 and 7, but notice uh, there is a leading going on here. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid and the calf, and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. And the cow and the bear shall feed, their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. I do want to mainly comment on this little phrase, a little child shall lead them. <laughs> but um, this, is, um, this is the scripture where whole ministries are, I'm just going to comment on a little side note here, whole ministries are built on lion and the lamb ministries. And they quote that the lion shall lie down with the lamb. Many of you have heard that scripture before, the lion shall lie down with the lamb. The problem is that phrase is not in scripture. This is the closest that you come right here. And it is the wolf shall dwell with the lamb, which is not a lion, laying down with the lamb. The next one says, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid. But neither one of those are lying with the lamb. And the calf with the young lion, the fat one together, and then verse 7, and the, and the cow. And the bear shall feed, their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. But there is no scripture that says the lion shall lie down with the lamb. And most of you have heard that somewhere and have believed that was scripture. And I just want to say that it is your responsibility, and that's one of the reasons why you're in Bible school, is there's a whole lot of stuff floating around that people quote as scripture and it's not scripture. And, and that's neither here nor there in one sense, but in another sense it is. And that is, you want to know what the Bible says. You don't want to know what fables say. You don't want to know what people say. You don't know what... Everybody, everybody... I mean, most of the people that you went up to, if you said something about, you know, that scripture that says the lion shall lie down with the lamb, they'll go, yeah, yeah. <laughs> then your next prayer should be, show it to me. Yeah. And, and that's good for them. Because they will hopefully dig out their Bible, search around, and come back and go, God is not even in there like that. And we want to know what the Word of God says. I mean, it's the Word of God. And when you change it up, it's no longer the Word of God, it's the Word of man. But we're talking about leadership. And uh, this is uh, last class I did all the talking, so this one I'm going to let you do a little bit of talking and see if, what we can come up with. Um, when it comes to leadership, there are two main, and I get to use my new chalk holder. Thanks to Chris. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty exciting looking too. Um, look, it opens too. <laughs> um, commitment, let me get this thing out of here. You need to put your keys on it. Yeah, it looks like uh, it's multiple of use here. All right, we want to talk about uh, commitment, which is a lot of times in relationship to desire, right? And then uh, competence. which is in relationship to ability. Yeah, that's, that's pretty cool. Commitment and competence. And so a person says, well, I want to be a leader. I'm committed. I'm committed. I'm high on commitment. But how's your competence level? How's your ability? How are your abilities to 
lead to do what is necessary to carry it out. And so you find that some people are high in commitment and low in confidence. Others are maybe have all sorts of abilities. But they don't really utilize their abilities for the Lord. You know what I'm saying? I mean, they're multi-talented. But they reserve back. They're always reserving back. Um, there are some people who are, um, they, they, you can say that they're high in confidence and high in that. Or low in, low in desire. And if your desire is low, you know, you say, well, my desire is low because my abilities are low. Well, these are things where you begin to get into the presence of the Lord. And this is exactly what people like Joshua and others did. They began to just get into the presence of the Lord. Because you know what? Even if you have a high level of commitment, and even if you have a personal high level of competency or ability, there's something else that's needed. What is it? Well, obviously Jesus, because we are talking about Christian leadership here. But, I mean, one of the things is, is like the scripture, you ought to be able to lead people. You ought to be able to lead people. What, what if you really have all sorts of uh, abilities and you're really commitment, committed and people just won't follow? When I first came to the Lord and was in Bible school, I don't know what the problem was, but my voice is a kind of an unusual voice and, and uh, Deb, like if the girls were, when they were little, were playing in the backyard, if she yelled, girls, time to eat, you would hear it all over the block. I mean, she's got a voice that carries. But if I did that, you wouldn't hardly hear me out into the yard. My voice isn't a voice that carries. It isn't a voice that's just real, real life. It's not a J.W. voice, real commanding voice, and, you know, all that sort of thing. I don't have a commanding voice. And so, it was very common for me in Bible school when a bunch of us would be standing around talking and sharing. Somebody would share and somebody would share here and somebody would share there. And then I'd start in sharing. And right in the middle, just as I was getting to, sh to share, somebody else would start sharing. And then they'd just go on without, and then I'd try again, and then I was going, you know, what? I mean, it happened regularly. And I mean, enough that I still remember it to this day. And I go, what's wrong with me, you know? And, uh, you know, I, of course, I knew J.W. back then, and I knew when he spoke, people go, you know, like Payne Weber or something, you know. And everybody would want to listen. And I just thought, man, I wonder, I wonder what my problem is. And, you know, over the years that has changed, but the truth was it seemed like at that time, particularly in my first year or so of school, I mean, I'm, I might have a desire, and I love Jesus, and I, I had some abilities that I could, you know, use for God and all this sort of thing, but nobody really wanted to follow me, and thank God they did, you know, <laughs> you know thank the Lord, you know, because it wasn't my time to, quote, unquote, be leading, it was my time to be following, Amen. And, to, and taking in and learning and trying to trying to receive from the Lord. And so, so there comes a time, and I don't know how to describe it or whatever, because you as a person are no different, but there comes a time when God says that you, God, and it's not just God saying something, where you can lead and people really want to follow you. And now, why would we want that to happen? Why would we want anybody to follow me or you or why? Something? Not? If you really knew the Lord, you know, in reality. Amen. <laughs> if you really knew the Lord, you'd want him to follow because it's like what Paul said, follow me while I follow Christ. Why else? Why would you why would you want people to follow you? That's good. That's real good. What she's saying is that thing that we are talking about in our first couple of classes, and that is this body thing begins to get hold of you. And, and all of a sudden, you're not happy enough that you might have truth and security and all this stuff. You begin to think, 
you know, I'm not complete without everyone else. And so you begin to dedicate yourself that as many as can come in to this. And so you, um, now you may have no desire to lead, but you have a desire for people to know the Lord. You may have no, no desire in you at all to lead, but you may have a desire to see the body become complete. Right? And so you do it out of obedience. Not because you're seeking something. Okay? Why else? Okay, let me throw up a couple of uh, different uh, words here. And you tell me what you think. They're going to be real similar. But we need to be able to clearly know the difference. To know the difference of these truths and how they affect us. Burden, calling, and vision. My marker just laid an egg. <laughs> There's more to come. Alright, somebody want to comment on any one of these? Cassie? You can have a burden for something, but that doesn't mean the Lord's called you to do that. I mean, I have a burden to help hurting girls, but the Lord may not be calling me, or that may not be Jesus for me to do that. But I may have a strong feeling that I want to do that. That's, that's good. I think there are a lot of people that go to the mission field because they have a burden. And I have been a missionary, and I am regularly around missionaries. When all these trips that I go on, a couple of weeks, I'm going to be around a lot of missionaries again. I'm telling you, it's tough if you're just out there with a burden. You saw a need. A burden can be nothing more than you seeing a need and going. Okay? Somebody want to comment on, yeah? Um, I have a comment on vision. Okay. Okay. If you have a burden that the Lord's giving you the calling and the vision, then you can you can communicate that to people so they can see that same vision and enter in and 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 give their lives and themselves to what is in the Lord's heart. And so part of being a leader is being able to communicate the vision to those who are following so that they are following the vision of the Lord. And if you just have a burden and the people sense the burden but they don't have the vision, then they're just kind of doing things. That they're not really being part of what God's asked you to carry in the earth of His heart. Does anybody basically agree with that? <clears throat> okay. Anybody else want to comment on any of these? No? I think that um, talking about vision in contrast to calling and burden, uh -huh. um, the vision to me has more of an eternal connotation than calling and burden. To me, and I, I don't know if this is quite right, but I know that we're all called as believers, there's a calling as a believer, but in ministry there's a calling and there's, there's usually a label or a title involved. A burden is again meeting a need, but vision oftentimes has, has to do with seeing something eternal in God. And then you're walking by that even though you're walking out of the earth, but you're walking by something eternal. Yeah. But calling and vision to me don't, I mean calling and burden to me don't seem to have that same. Maybe we need to divide up vision because I'm hearing a couple. I'm hearing one thing here, but have you ever had somebody come up to you and you're talking to them and they start and they've got a ministry and they say, "Say, my vision is to." Okay, is that the same as what Mallory and Kelly have been talking about? Somebody want to comment? What's the difference between the two? One is like a two types of, I guess, dividing up the word vision. There's mm -hmm. one where um, I see something, and this is what I'm going to be about doing this. Um, whatever it is, uh, cleaning chalkboards, that's my vision. And I got a vision of a thousand chalkboards to be cleaned every week. Yeah. That's my vision, y'all. Let's go for it. Or, you know, just a simple. Something like that. Whatever. Another term you might have use is my glorified goal is. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Really? Yeah. Okay. And I um, think kind of like 
talking about it, and I'm not sure if she was saying this, but this is what I was thinking about vision. Mm -hmm. It's like where it's, you're just viewing, not necessarily vision, but you're viewing everything from a different realm, from a different plane, and you walk by that, and the bird, the calling and the burden come afterwards almost, or they just, they're there, but they're not there. They're not the motivator, they're not the director. The vision, as you see, is what directs as opposed to the calling the burden. Mm -hmm. But the vision is just like the way you just see completely. Amen. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Great. I think um, <coughs> as far as vision goes, the Bible says well, most people consider vision. Most people, like you are saying, you know, people say what black vision is. And it generally tends to lean toward a vision of building something. And then somehow that equates into glorifying God or bringing masses of people in. And it's like the vision that Jesus had was not that at all. You know, it's like Jimmy was saying, um, the vision that we should have is the one that the Lord has. His vision should be our vision. His vision is completely different, separate from one way we think see things completely. And he has a, he has an idea and um, a, a way of like his vision has to deal with government and conforming and all those things. And what I see a lot of times is most people are trying to apply this idea of a vision to a ministry and there's a lot of work but no conforming. And you can get really frustrated when and, you know, Chris was sharing this one time with me, said, you know, um, most ministries equal to going out and getting people saved and that's about where it stops. And you find a lot of leaders who don't understand why their vision is not being fulfilled because the people are getting saved, but nobody's conforming. So you don't see any progress. And you know, it's like it, the word says, the Lord says, you know, my, my way is not your way, neither my thoughts, your thoughts. And I think a lot of the vision has to do is just the way in the way that the Lord thinks in application to us in conforming his thoughts. Amen. <clears throat> Have you ever heard someone say, um, I have a vision to build the largest church in this city? Something like that. I have a vision to build that. Is that truly what vision means? No, it shouldn't be. That, in some cases, could be nothing more than a burden. That's right. Yes. It also could be a calling. The vision is something higher, and I appreciated how Mallory put it, in relationship to something more internal, something relating to the Lord and the finished work of the cross, this sort of thing. But that does work down into practical things, so you might even start here with vision and build. Now, let me say that, <clears throat> uh, has anybody ever gone to uh, some sort of a meeting where you've heard a motivational speaker? Anybody raise your hand? Yeah, most... Uh, some of you haven't. Wrong, you have. You ever been to church? <laughs> you know, I mean, some churches and some TV evangelists and some this and that. In, in some cases, you're just listening to a motivational speaker. And what can happen is, um, um, for an example, I'm not picking on anybody in particular, but there's a, a particular uh, uh, program, not TV program, but a program for evangelizing. And um, it involves books and going through books and everything, and uh, it's called Evangelism Explosion. Anybody familiar with Evangelism Explosion? Anybody been through Evangelism Explosion? Okay. Um, <clears throat> nobody has, but it's a highly motivational program. <clears throat> and what the person does is that the person who presents it is somebody from Evangelism Explosion, and, and uh, what they do is they come in and they get your church together and you have special meetings and they start showing you all the things that they've done that's worked and they show you how to fill out cards and they give you a little thing that you go through questioning questions with when you knock on the door. Well, we're, you know, the basic thing is knock, knock, knock. Hi, well, I'm from so and so church and we're just out taking a survey in the community and I wonder if you'd take a few, if you have a few minutes to ask a few questions. And of course they go, well, some people say yes, some people say no. And so they go, okay, number one, you know, and at the first three or four or, you know, <clears throat> makes it feel like you're taking a poll or something, you know what I mean? And, and then pretty 
everything there, you know, supposedly have you on your knees crying, asking Jesus to come in your heart. <clears throat> um, I believe that probably um, God gave that specific church that method, and it really, really did explode their church and work. But I have seen that program over and over and over be used, and that boy, when the people, when they were in those meetings and talking about it and looking at the cards, and they would break off into little groups, you know, and you'd practice it on one another, you know what I mean? You say, well, what do you think? You know, and of course you've got an enthusiastic person who's also in the program trying to learn, so everything's you know highly motivated and. Yeah, you know, we're going to win the whole world. We're going to bring them all in, and we're going to have this big church as a result of this and everything. And so, I mean, everybody is motivated and enthused. And at the end of the week, man, it's just incredible. So they release them out into the, and, and they come back, and they have, you know, those little uh, team meetings and stuff, and they begin to talk about it. And, and usually the, the first week or, you know, first few days, man, it's, they get some pretty good results. And by the end of the week, you know, they're, they're still excited. And, at the end of two weeks, man, it's really dropped major. And by the end of the month, nobody's excited anymore. Okay? Now, would you say that they have vision? No. Because I believe that vision controls you. I believe vision overrides your selfish motivations. I believe vision overcomes your flesh, your priorities, your wants and lack of, and true vision begins to look literally into the reality of God, and it doesn't just glimpse something there, it sees. I mean, your eyes are open. Can you see the difference? Glimpsing something may not change you, but when you begin to see and you begin to see what God wants, and you begin to see what's in His heart, and those sort of, sorts of things. It begins to. I appreciated what Molly shared about. You know, you begin to see that He, you know, He didn't make this thing where just you could be happy. You know, you're, I'm, you know, I'm saved. I'm happy. Everything's going my way. So forget everybody else. I mean, He He built it into His. If you truly look into His heart, you will never be satisfied if if you know everything. You'll never be satisfied because it is in his heart till we all come. See? And so you go, well, you know, I guess this is going to take the rest of my life. I mean, you know what I mean? It affects you. You have seen something that has changed you. And it hasn't changed you up here. Because these seminars and conferences, man, they can get you excited, I'm telling you. They can get you excited. Another example of that is... Um, going out on uh, these uh, short-term mission trips. Short-term mission trips. Short-term mission trips. Now, I think they're really good, and I think they have a lot of benefit, and every one of my girls went on a short-term mission trip. But what happens is, is that you, what you do is you call in a bunch of kids and get them all excited and stuff, and you have their kind of music, and you have their sort of skits, and you teach them all this stuff, and you go out and you do this mission trip, and God moves, because God moves, you know, He honors their faith and stuff, and you get out there, but you're only out there for a week, two weeks, a month, two months, and then you come back, and everything comes crashing down because you had a momentary environment where everybody was on fire, but they weren't all on fire, were they? The proof of that is when they go back home, it just goes, amen? And so what happens is, is that then something happens with those kids and you have to go to the next batch of kids. And so you keep doing that until you run out of kids. And of course, the good thing is, is the kids keep growing up every year. You know, and they can keep having 16-year-olds becoming 17-year-olds and 17-year-olds becoming 18-year-olds. But very few of those kids have gone on to just do great and mighty things. Because if that was true, YWAM and, and uh, what, Team Mania and all that, man, I mean, they'd already taken the world. Because, I mean, they've had thousands upon thousands in one year. Thousands upon thousands upon thousands upon thousands. Okay? Is it, am I putting that down? No, I'm not putting that down. I thank God for, you know, as people. I, I mean, I've known people, major people from Youth uh, with a Mission and uh, from Teen Mania and uh, these guys. No, no, many of them personally. They love Jesus. They are doing more than what was going on before we did that. 
Okay? So please don't get, don't think that there's anything negative in my heart toward any of that. It's not. It's just that I saw that this short-term thing isn't working. Jesus is not short-term. The life of Christ is not short-term. The commitment to Christ is not short-term. What you begin to see when you truly begin to come to vision is you begin to, to see that, that this is what you must give yourself to the rest of your life, not because of you, but because of Him. And this is, uh, and, and if you truly see, then uh, when, because let me tell you something, you can, well, first of all, let's, let's just kind of go through this. Burden. I have a burden. I want to go to China. Okay, so that's all you get, just a burden. You go to China, you get discouraged. Right? But remember this, where God guides, He provides. Amen? So that's the good thing about calling. <laughs> you get a little extra there, don't you? You get a little extra. You get some provision for what you're doing because it's not what you're doing. It's what He's doing. And it's His burden or it's His calling. And, and the two have begun to be matched together. And so now you're going. But let me tell you, and I'm just going to tell you flat out, many of you are too young to know this, but calling is not enough. That's right. Calling will wear you out after a while. Do you, have anybody ever heard this term? Burnout. Yeah. It's a real thing. Yeah. It is a very real thing. And, and what it is is that you're serving God with all your heart, all your resources, all your mind, all your strength and everything else. And... And trust me, folks, there's only so much a human can do. And you begin to get burned out. And you say, and you, and all of a sudden, without without this vision burning in you, you're called and, and where he's guiding, he's providing. But I mean, you know, such, such as uh, you're ministering to a whole bunch of little orphan kids, and God's, you know, using you, and you pray for them, and they get healed, but you're still burned out. That stuff happens. I mean, the provision is there through you. But the calling isn't always a minister to, ministry to you. It is a ministry through you. And I think that's where a lot of people miss it. Because they're, they're thinking, because I'm called, and because God is providing, and they can see a supernatural provision taking place, they assume that that's all I need, and it's not. And so, but when you begin to have vision, then there's something, I don't really know how to put this, but it's like, um, it's like this nuclear reactor on the inside. This, you know, I'm just talking here, I'm just trying to come up with it. You see the Lord, and He begins to be revealed in you in a certain way, and it is like a nuclear reactor that at times, after a while, the reality of that reactor begins to fade in you. But as you come back to the Word or you're in a certain time or situation, bam, the Lord begins to quicken something that is in you. Now, let me make sure that we understand that there is a, that I'm not talking about that something that comes upon you like the anointing or something that comes to you like inspiration. Many of you have been inspired. You have heard something and you jumped up and said, yeah! And you know, you've gone two weeks and that was gone. You know, and you're no longer inspired about that. God doesn't want to inspire you. He wants, he wants to deliver you and, and use you. I mean, I don't think, let me say, it. yes, God wants to inspire you. But that, I'm just saying as the primary motivation. He doesn't want to just keep coming to you and inspiring you and let you get down and come back and inspire you and then you're up and then let you go down and come back and inspire you and let you go up. No, there is, there, there is this reality of seeing the Lord where you see, and when I say seeing the Lord, I'm not talking about a vision. Okay, let's make a difference between vision and a vision. You don't see Jesus standing in the corner. You know, I mean, I remember one time I was, you know, and this is me, and you got to make, you know, amends for me because it's me. But, you know, I, I remember sitting in a meeting, and uh, and I'm sitting there with, with uh, 
not very many people, eight or ten pastors or something, and um, and we're sharing the word, and man, I mean, the Lord's moving and everything, and the guy says, oh my God, oh my God. praying and worshiping and we were just all down together and everything. I saw a vision of Jesus over in the corner and he came in and he came into the room right here with us. Hello. <laughs> and I'm thinking, doesn't the scripture say if two or more gather in his name, he's already in the midst? What took him so long? <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm thinking, uh, he should have been there as soon as we got in his name. Is that right or wrong? And I mean, him, all, what, first of all, what's he doing over there in the corner? You know, I didn't see him there, you know. He comes out of the corner long after we're, I mean, the Spirit of God's moving and everything, you know, and then Jesus decides to show up? No, that was, you know. <laughs> you know but, but this guy was all excited because he had a vision of this. And I'm thinking, now here's what I'm thinking, and again, you have to... <laughs> You have to realize this is me. But I'm thinking, isn't the word of God more powerful than the fish? And doesn't the living reality of that word, when I read it, just do something in me? And I say, man, glory to God, Jesus is right here in our midst right now. Whether I feel anything or you feel anything or anything else, the word is true. And isn't that glorious? And we say, that's glorious. Now that's what I like. I'm a word man. I admit it. I admit it. I'm a word man. I'm not an experienced man, but I've had my share of experiences. A bunch of them. But I don't live by my experiences. I live by the word. By every word that proceeds out of his mouth. And isn't that what Jesus said? You know? <coughs> Living by that word. And so, so what happens if out of those ten pastors that are sitting there, somebody is sitting there and they're they're not feeling anything. And God's moving and God's with us and everything, and they're not feeling anything. And they go, well, I wish I had a vision of Jesus coming in here. Now think about it for a minute. I would be able to get into this if I had a vision of Jesus coming in here. Now anybody, come on, somebody talk to me. What's wrong with that? Joseph. Now, you know, it says we walk by faith and not by sight. You know, that's the main thing that we're, you know, we're walking by faith and pray by faith and living by faith. And, you know, you're wanting to see everything and, and have all these visions. And you might as well, you know, not live by faith. Isn't that, isn't that, I mean, what a great scripture to bring up. What a great scripture to bring up. We walk, for we walk by faith, not by sight. And that whether it's spiritual insight. Now, again, let me make this absolutely clear that, that I have no problem with visions and stuff. And God shows me little things, having a vision. And, I mean, God shows me stuff all the time, okay? And I, I don't discount any of that. But the Word of God is first. Amen? Amen. This vision that we're talking about is founded on the Word. Okay? I mean, you, it, you can go to any place in this Bible and all of a sudden that nuclear reactor kick up in you and boom, you are in full nuclear power again because, not because it's restarted something, but it is, as it were, awakened you to what is the thing that drives you. How about that? The thing that drives you, that is beyond you. Right. And, and I'm telling you, if you don't have that, when you come to into your rope, either physically or emotionally or something else, you're going to fall down in a big heap. Yeah. You're going to get burned out, or you're going to get bitter, or you're going to get upset, or mad or something, and you're going to go, you know, I mean, you know, why, why are these people doing it? Why don't people appreciate the word? Or why don't this or that? Or da 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 da. And you go through all this kind of stuff. And, you know, I mean, can you see Jesus walking around his inner life going, Oh my God, why don't these people accept my word? I mean, no, I'm the Son of God. Man, I'm, I'm, not, I'm doing nothing but good to anybody. I never did anything bad. Don't they recognize this? I mean, my God, what is going on here? 
You know, and then he's hanging on the cross and they're slapping him and mocking him and shoving his fears on his side. And he says, Father, kill him! But he didn't say that. Because he had something that he was living for beyond what he was experiencing. Amen. That pressed him through, pressed him through many a troubled time. Let me tell you, you need it. You need it. You need, and I'm not trying to spell it out. I mean, I call it the revelation of Christ, but you call you need vision from the Lord that can keep you going no matter what. Now, I will say this. My first couple of years, if it wasn't for miracles and revivals and special things going off, I would have been in real trouble. I would have. I wasn't mature enough to, I didn't even know the scriptures, much less the word. The scriptures are just this ink on white paper. I didn't even know what the ink on white paper was talking about, much less see into it and see the living word. So the experiences were good for me. They kept me up. Amen? They kept me excited. They kept me going. It was God. God did Fantastic. I mean, you talk, I, had, I had a few cool visions. I mean, I've never told you about them, but I had some cool visions, man. They were some cool things that went on. But you know what? I don't refer to those anymore. There was a time that I'd refer back and go, man, one time I saw, you know, and, and I would just go, yeah. But now, the life of Christ is steady in me, not perfect in me. He's perfect, but it's not sound as it needs to be yet. But I tell you what, man, there's a steadiness that can that can press through all this other junk. And and see, calling. Now, now we've been talking a lot about Joseph, right? The life of Joseph in the in the prison. He saw a vision. In that vision, if you look close enough, is vision. Okay? But I'm just saying. Everything that seemed to, to be leading in the way of his calling was going opposite of that. I mean, I'm called to sit on the throne and lead people and help people and save people and da 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 and all this kind of stuff, you know, and my life is going downhill with every step. Every new thing that happens is worse. You know, have you ever said, well, thank God I finally got to this point. Nothing worse can happen and then something does. <laughs> I, I have been there. And you just kind of go on. And then it just falls down a few more notches. <laughs> Man, how low can we go? <laughs> and you just, you just have no clue. I mean, you think you, you, your desire, remember we are talking about desire? Your desire is to go forward and to do this thing for God. But it seems as if, early on, it seems like the devil is hindering everything that you want to do. And then you eventually come to this conclusion, my God, this is God that's hindering. <laughs> it's a weird thing that happens. I mean, at first it's just like, you the devil, every time I want to just really, really bust a move. I mean... You know, because that desire is so strong to love the Lord so much. You know, and you just go, every time I really want to just boom, and you know, I mean, there's just this thing that you feel is just going to break open one day, and, you know, it's just all going to happen, you know. <laughs> boom, something happened. You go, the devil, boy, the devil just knows everything. It seems like every turn, he's just there, and he just, man, and it's just, you know. And then after a while, you start going, you know, the devil ain't that smart. My you know, I think God is doing something here. And what he's doing is, a lot of times the vision, he cannot show you that vision until you're in a certain place. Spiritually. He's got to put you through some things. You know, we think Christianity is always going up and everything getting better. But, you know, Jesus' last days on this earth were, you know, on a cross. And most of the real men of God, folks, died. I mean, look at Paul. Had his head cut off. You know, his last words was probably goodbye to earth. Hello, Jesus. You know. <laughs> <laughs> you know. His mom. 
You know? And somebody's standing there going, well, he's a failure. You know? He's a failure. He can't even get ahead in this world. But that's the deal. God works you even after he gives you your calling. And you're and you have this burden. And let's just say burden is, is desire. Okay? Let's say it's a true desire in your heart. And you say, I have I have desire and I have calling, but I'm not breaking loose. I can't break forth. What is wrong? And it seems, and here's the way it seems, and I'm just telling you, maybe everybody's experience isn't exactly the, the same, but it seems like every time you're just on the verge, then it shuts down and you fall back, and then you kind of work your way back, and then da 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 And that's where you have to say, God, are you trying to do something higher than my calling and higher than my burden? And he will say, well, yeah. Yeah, I, I have something that's more important. Important to who? I mean, calling and burden are important to me. He would say, this <laughs> is important to me. Amen. That's his heart. See, and because he loves you so much, he's held, he holds you back. Isn't that crazy? I mean, I can give you a lot of scriptures on this. We won't do it tonight, but I'm, I'm telling you, scriptures where it just seems to happen. And it's not God being mean. It's not, it's not the God who loves everybody but you. <laughs> and it, but, it's, but it sometimes feels like that. This is, this is my Father, the one who loves everybody but me. You know, God is love except to me. You know? And, and, it, and it just feels that way, but I'm, I'm here to tell you that it is his tremendous love that is doing what is doing. Really. And you can't imagine his commitment to you to put you through that and, and knowing that you're going to think bad things about him. That's right. But because he cares so much for you, so much, he does it anyway, knowing the backlash of that is going to be that he's, he's bad or mean or not taking care of business or something. Mm -hmm. You know? But there's a, always a hope mm -hmm. that the child will grow up into a young man or whatever, adulthood, and will go, oh my goodness. All that you were doing, you did out of love, and I fought you the whole way. You were trying to do the best for me, and I was fighting you. And it's like the prodigal son. He comes to himself. He goes, man, in my father's house is bread and provision and my father, and I will return to him. When he does, the father goes, okay, all this, all this provision, all this is yours, and you are mine and I'm yours. And so then begins eternal oneness. Not separateness and you know all the things we go through. All right. So, anybody else have a comment on burden, calling, and vision? Okay. Um, just about the whole vision thing. You were talking about the short missions and all that. And the, um, what was that thing called again? The explosion. The uh -huh. And uh, I think. Um, you, you just briefly hit upon it that um, it's it's hard to see the real vision. You have that environment for it to work in. You know, if you're hitting things sporadically, you're not really going to see true vision. And I think there's a lot to be said about the environment because one of the things that this is, this is something the Lord showed me about, I remember about five years ago, there was a, a season of about a year and a half, maybe a couple of years, the Lord had us go up all of us. We just go down to Fry Street like yeah. every Thursday and we'd be out there. Well, and during that same time, there was a there was a evangelical explosion going on at the UNT with a lot of the Christian <coughs> students there, and they would come out on Thursday nights and, and you know do evangelism. And um, I knew a couple of people from the college, and one night two of them, you know, we were talking, and they, and they asked me, they said, because they saw us, us talking to a bunch of the kids out there. In fact, we would sit at the table at the pizza.
this place. And the kids would come to us yeah. and sit and hang out with yeah. us. And a couple of them were asking, they said, you know, we've been doing this thing for I don't know how long. And the, they won't listen to us. You know, I mean, maybe a couple will have a conversation, but for the most part, they just blow us off. But, you know, it's like, what is it you guys are doing right? Because they, they don't, you don't go to them, they come to you. They seem to like you, like, like you're their friend or something. And, you know, I explained to them that, you know, we're out there all the time. They know us by, you know, where we live and what we do. And I told you know, they, they know how we live. They know that this thing for us isn't just, a class on a Thursday night or a Wednesday night, and then we go out and practice it. And you know, and that's the comments from some of the kids in the street. Are, you know, I've heard before. Back then, it's like, oh, here they come. You know, they're we're, you know, they're coming to get their guinea pigs. And they knew that that's basically what was happening. These people went to the class, now they're going to practice on it. And uh, you know, I got to explain to them. I mean, basically, that's how the kids felt. You know, and I explained to the the Christians that I knew that, you know, we live this every day. We have this environment. This is what we do. You know, it's not put down to anybody, but this is the way it is. You know, they know us. They know where we're at. They know that we're, this is a 24-hour-a-day thing for us. It's not, our, it's not just evangelism that we're doing, but we're wanting these people to know the life of Christ, the true vision of Christ and crucified. The, um, the calling of living Christ, not just uh, a ministry. You know, and the funny thing is, um, a lot of the the kids were like, you know, if I were to be a follower of Jesus, that's the way I would want to live. You know, they were in their minds it was like I couldn't do this unless it was a commitment. But uh, it was just kind of weird because a lot of the other Christians were like, how do you do that? You know, there's I've got so many things I got to do. I mean, I plan to do this, and I, you know, I've got my life plan. You know, don't you have a life? Yeah. Which reminds me, Fry Street Fair is this Saturday, I think, and it's going to be real expensive to get in, twenty some odd dollars. But uh, anyway, you can always go stand outside. You know, we've done that before. Right? I just thing to also see because stuff like this happens. What if in the circumstances of life after you've been down the road 5, 10, 15 years, the calling somehow some for some reason is taken away. Not necessarily that God takes it away, but something happens and, and you're not able to function in your calling. What do you do then? You're pretty much useless, aren't you? You're just a useless sack of potatoes. You're dumber than a bag of hammers. <laughs> no, that's not true. <clears throat> um, but people go through this because they find their identity not in the vision, but in the calling. And that's real important to see that difference. They find their identity in the calling, not in the vision. Paul's going to emphasize in Ephesians 4, first he says, you know, I present a little beseech it. I hope walk worthy of the calling which you are called, comma, with all willingness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, and bearing to keep the unity of the Spirit and bond of peace. And that's what he was emphasizing. This is the calling that you're, you know, it, you're low and being gentle and long suffering, bearing with one another in love. And that's, I mean, whatever the Lord puts in your heart to do or to, you know, is life in you, that's. That's what you are. That's the calling that you perceive. You know, walk worthy of that. Walk worthy of, you know, edifying one another. You know, having that spirit of gentleness. And, and then later on, chapter four. That's when he says, and he gave some to be apostles, some to prophets. You know, some pastors, and teachers. Mm -hmm. You know, for the quickening of the same thing for that. That's but right. So when your focus, I guess, gets on, you know, that specific thing that the Lord is giving you to carry out by Him, that you know you can you know, get off and. 
maybe excuse being, <laughs> you know, gentle or, you know, all these things. And not excuse it, but it's just not in you because that life of the Lord, Jesus Christ, that is wanting to be that, you know, have to be that calling in you mm -hmm. is not formed in you. And you're just wanting to grab hold of what, what that thing is mm -hmm. and not the Lord and let that Lord come out of you. In that way, which he's called you to be working on. It becomes a doing of a task instead of a living the life. Yeah. That's good. Jim? I was just going to say that um, if you're fighting your identity in your calling, mm -hmm. then you're not fighting your identity in Christ. Right. That's true. And you, and you can sure become discouraged when, uh, and see, God will see to it. He'll take away your, your callings. He'll take away, I mean, he does stuff like this. I mean, he's the one who calls you, but he can take it away too. I and mean, it's his, his deal. Uh, the example I always think of is that, you know, here Jesus walks up and Peter and them haven't caught any fish. And so he says, well, cast your nets here. So they cast their nets and they catch all this fish and everything. And they get so much they pull it in. And now he's the, the best, most wealthy and most blessed fisherman around. And then Jesus says to them, come, forsake your nets and follow me. Well, you just bless my, my business. Yeah, well, I, my goal is, and this is, I think, what Joseph was saying, I want you to follow me, not just have a blessed business or a blessed ministry or something like that. And so when you get wrapped up in your calling and then, you know, somebody, you know, starts, you know, they call you reverend or they call you pastor or they call you dean or they call you, you know, uh, house supervisor, they call you something that has something. And, and uh, this is what I think also what Joseph was saying is you begin to, you, you begin to identify with that and with that you begin to attach pride and importance and all sorts of things to that instead of being found in him, not having your own righteousness, not having your own this or that, and simply serving by life. But what does it say? But by love, serve one another. By love, serve one another. And so that's something that's working in you. That's not something that you're working. It's not, it's not a gifting. Uh, the, the ministry part may be a gifting, but the, but the spirit of that is a nature that must be worked in you. And so God is not in a hurry. We're in a hurry. But God is not in a hurry. Because it may take it may take the better part of a person's life just to bring them to a place where they're finally usable, and and he can do more in only three years left of your life that is in that case than all that time. Here's our line. But I wasted so many years. Well, I don't know that you wasted it. I just think it's the the way of man. We're just we're hard headed and we're selfish. And we read into it. I mean, he does something good to us, and we read into that, you know what I mean? And we get puffed up over stuff, you know? I mean, he puts his hand on us in front of everybody, and we go, oh, I'm, and that, you know, that's one of the things that I was saying about Joseph is, uh, I think that he was seeing, you know, when the Father gave him the coat of many colors, I think that that represented to him the Father, the Heavenly Father, and then at the end, when he stood before the brothers, he had no condemnation for them. I think he was trying to show them the love of the Father. I think he was trying to say, look, he doesn't, I'm not special. He doesn't love me more than everybody else. I just found it out at an early age and walked in it, and I got a lot of manifestation and stuff early on, but it is the same heart for you, and I just want you to see that. I really believe it because, I mean, look how he acted. He didn't, he didn't sit on the throne and go, yep. See, I was the special one. It was almost as if he wasn't the special one, and he was trying to convince him, look, come on in. You know, we're all in this. And the, the, the feeling in the heart of the Father is the same toward all of us. And was trying to bring them into that. So, you know, um, but we don't, it's, it's like uh, we, we're, we're, in the things that we do, we're seeking for some sort of, self-fulfillment or self-identity. And you will never find who you really are until you see it in the face of Jesus. There's no way. You can't possibly find it by looking at yourself. You can't find it by looking at His giftings or anointings or gifts to you. Because you can, you can prophesy, you can heal, you can do all this stuff and on the inside still be a mess. 
you can be used of God and, and what God guides you and then provides for you and you're still a mess. Amen? But then you begin to long for the thing that he longs for first. The inworking of this thing and this thing settles something in your heart not just about God, about you, about his plan and therefore things and props when they get in the way aren't really going to that, how can they stop? But you have to see that. If you don't see it, then you're going to go, oh, you know. You know, well, there's this song that, that we used to sing a lot. Uh, this mountain shall be removed. And everybody's singing this mountain shall be removed. This mountain shall be removed. I must be rich, said the Lord. Not by my, everybody not by power and more brutal under tongue, tongue. And then we walk out, you know, and stop our tongue. Go, I guess I can't do this. There was an obstacle in the way. Anybody see any hypocrisy in any of that? You know? It's not about sitting and singing and getting inspired. If that's the case, you know, during the inspirational times, you ought to just stick your nose in the Word of God and hope and pray for vision. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That way, when you go out and something happens, you go, look, I don't care what I see. I don't walk by sight. You see, that's the problem is, and you know, Joseph was the one who brought that scripture up, but that's the problem is, is that we believe that scripture, but we do not apply it to our lives. And so, when we see things contrary, that discourages us. Because why? We walk by sight. We need to quit. We need to walk by faith. All right, we're going to take a little break. And we'll come.